My job is, is just to welcome you to Fordham Law School. My name is uh, Robin Lenhardt. I'm a professor here, and I am the faculty director of the new Center on Race, Law, and Justice. And uh, clearly, one of the best things that we've achieved this year is to have the Perception Institute here to give uh, this important um, presentation on issues that are obviously uh, even more important today than they were um, you know, even a year ago. So I just want to thank you all for being here, uh, invite you to come back to uh, events that we have, uh, and to give special thanks to, to Rachel and Alexis for being here, and then also Mr. Brennan for uh, being a co-sponsor uh, at this event. So thank you all. Welcome. Thank you, Professor. Hey, good afternoon, and thank you all for coming. The Perception Institute, uh, Alexis McGill-Johnson, who's the executive director, she and Rachel Godsell, who will be our presenters today, have really uh, uh, put together a program that I think we're all going to enjoy and we're all going to learn from, and it, I, I hope that it'll give us something to take away that we can use in our practices. Uh, I'm the public defender for the state of Delaware, and um, this stuff is really important stuff to anybody who's doing indigent defense work. Virtually everybody involved in indigent defense work believes in the cause of justice, they believe in doing the right thing, and they believe that they're helping people. And what we're gonna learn here is maybe some ways that we can help them better. Because whether we acknowledge it now or not, I think we're going to learn that bias creeps into much of what we do. And that sort of, can infect the system in a way that we don't always appreciate. And if our goal is to really defend our clients in the best way possible, to create a system that is just, that will give our, our clients the best chance for not only a just series of processes, but good outcomes, then we should pay attention today because we're going to learn some things that are important. These are things that really, in a sub subliminal way, go to the core of what justice is and how we attempt to provide justice to the clients that we defend. Uh, I'm here uh, on behalf of the American College of Trial Lawyers. There are a number of uh, uh, public defenders here. In the, uh, we're in the Public Defender Committee of the American College of Trial Lawyers. So with that said, Rachel. Uh, thank you so much. It is really thrilling to be here, and thank you all so much for participating in this. We do want this to be a presentation of the science. We are the Perception Institute, and we present regularly to a wide variety of audiences. We're a consortium of social psychologists and law professors and culture makers and advocates, and we bring together again, sort of social scientists from across the country to create teams to try and identify the ways in which insights from the social sciences can, can address the core challenges we face, particularly those challenges linked to how our identities play out in the world. And as we all know, and as Robin indicated, and thank you so much to Robin Lenhart and to the Fordham Law School for hosting us here today, as Robin indicated, we have now for two years been in this utterly critically painful moment in which particularly the unarmed killings of black men and boys and the way the criminal justice system responds has resulted in a questioning of the system that eats at the core of our democracy. And how we respond to that and how our institutions respond is, is critical for how we go forward. As Brendan said, to be addressing these issues to criminal defense attorneys who are playing the role in our criminal justice system of defending those against whom the government is bringing its weight is, is a challenge because criminal defense attorneys are truly doing just work. And yet, as Song Richardson, who's one of our who was one of our colleagues, has indicated, there are a set of questions that even criminal defense attorneys with the commitments to justice that they have, have to think about in order to ensure that this work is done fairly. So our objective is to understand the role that implicit bias, racial anxiety, and stereotype threat three phenomena that have been identified in the social sciences as core to the role race plays may play specifically in criminal defense. So we'll talk about first 
how race and ethnicity may affect how decision makers, how others see clients. Second, how race and ethnicity may affect how lawyers see and interact with clients, despite, of course, the best of intentions and the most and deepest commitments. And finally, but not at all, kind of not at all least, how it is that race and ethnicity dynamics in the workplace matter to the experience in the criminal justice system and essentially to how our justice system operates. And our goal will be to share interventions that have been developed within the social sciences and that are now being tested in offices across the country to figure out how we move forward in a way that's meaningful. So these are a set of questions that Song Richardson has identified as potentially being salient in this space. So first, the risk of how clients are seen. How do decision makers see clients? Is there a risk that as a result of race, ethnicity, and other identity dynamics, prosecutors may charge differently? Is there a risk that plea offers may be harsher, that judge and juries have a set of presumptions that make the work that criminal defenders do more difficult and what to do about those presumptions? And finally, how judges and others in the system treat people in the courtroom, what the experience is of being someone of color who walks into a courtroom in this country. Second, what are the risks for criminal defense attorneys? We know that people bring themselves to this work because they're committed to defending fairly. And yet there's a set of questions. Presumably, and as we've been told when we talk to criminal defense attorneys across the country, it's impossible in some ways, despite sort of broad process commitments, not to feel as though you have to work harder for factually innocent clients. And yet, are those assessments of who's factually innocent potentially subject to bias? Are conclusions about innocence potentially subject to the role of race and ethnicity? Do we evaluate evidence differently, potentially because of race or ethnicity? Do people interact less effectively when they're cross-race interactions? And finally, is there a risk that plea deals are being negotiated differently depending upon the race or ethnicity of the client? These are risks that are real that, again, Song Richardson has identified. And finally, within the workplace, we know there's a broad commitment to treating colleagues fairly. And yet, one of the issues that has been most salient when we've, when we've gone to criminal defense offices across the country is whether or not that happens. Are there a sufficient number of attorneys of color who are doing this work and able to do so without obstacles to navigate that are unique to them because of their race and ethnicity? Is their work evaluated differently? Is there, are there decisions made about what roles people play in cases based upon race or ethnicity? Is the interaction in the workplace different based upon race or ethnicity in a way that makes the workplace less hospitable and therefore less likely for colleagues of color to be retained? And finally, who stays and who's promoted? What is the leadership like in organizations that are committed to criminal defense? Is it, you know, can we treat it as fair and can we trust it? So I'd like to hand the mic to my uh, executive director, Alexis McGill-Johnson, who is the leader of the Perception Institute and to whom I'm constantly indebted. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Rachel, uh, and thank you all for, for being here. It's an incredible honor. Um, I thank you, particularly the criminal defenders, for what you do and for actually for doing this work, because knowing that you're engaging in this process um, to start interrogating your own thoughts around around race is um, is incredibly meaningful, and I know will will serve um, serve many populations to come. Um, we start here. I love that the title is called Defending Fairly. Um, because so much of what we are trying to do is to, to really get us as a, as a community to start interrogating our understanding of fairness. Um, we can look at these images, you can even look at the word racism and, um, and have a reaction. I think for most of us, we are raised to be, to treat people fairly, to treat people kind of within the, the, the golden rule frame, and yet What's happening right now, you know, just to level set, this, this level of explicit bias that's happening, whether we're talking about the treatment of, of, um, of Muslim communities or some of the immigration debates, is being framed in very, very um, explicit uh, conversations. There's nothing kind of unconscious about what we're happening. While we're going to talk about the, the unconscious shortly, we just want to say we recognize the, the uptick and increase in what's happening on a, on a conscious level. 
And we also recognize how awful that makes us feel, right? There is a physiological component to the way, to our understanding of race. While, while again, while we largely understand race and ethnicity to be social constru constructs, um, we also know that, that race is an emotional experience, is a physiological experience. And so even for me, just seeing these images, seeing the word racism actually evokes something very, um, very emotional. Um, and yet we know that most Americans reject racism explicitly, right? They actually, you know, if you look at public opinion data over time, uh, people have come to understand that being a racist actually is kind of being a bad, uh, is a bad thing. But if most of us reject racism, then the question is what explains the, the racial outcomes? What explains the disparity in how we, um, uh, in how we understand um, what's happening in, in, in disproportionately in different communities? Perception, we talk about what we call the racial paradox, the idea that we can have egalitarian values and yet our values don't align with our disparities. We can actually, as a paradox, hold two concepts that seem to be completely in opposition and yet when we unpack them, we can see that they actually can be held at this, at, in the same way. And for us, um, that sense of paradox um, is, uh, we see three components of the racial paradox. We see, um, this contradiction that our fair values and our, um, our inequitable behavior and outcomes, um, there's a gap between, between that. We also recognize that there are a set of assumptions about how we're supposed to engage around race, about how we're supposed to practice fairness that are incredibly aspirational, Assumptions like being colorblind, assumptions like our ability to trust our own sense of objectivity, and that the world we're trying to create, particularly in our workplaces, is one of, of meritocracy, um, that there are these incredible aspirational assumptions, and yet they're also incredibly flawed because of how our brains and bodies react on, on the, um, uh, with respect to race, which we'll get into more. And last, there are a set of structural conditions that actually limit our ability to resolve what we would call this, this racial paradox. There are a set of structural conditions that um, limit our ability to, to correct for the, the, the information that we see. Um, you know, first, we, we just have to acknowledge the fact that, the, that there's a, there is an incredible amount of hypersegregation in our society. We're more segregated now than we were just a few years after Brown v. Board. And so the idea that we're actually engaged in the same education system, we're going to school together, we're living next to each other, um, you know, the, our workplaces are not as diverse as they could be. The idea that, um, that we, we're not actually breaking bread in the same way um, really limits our ability to have conversations to address it. So where do we get our information from? Largely the media. Our media is more consolidated now than it's, than it's uh, I think, almost uh, been in, in, in quite some time. And so the amount of information that we're getting is being dictated by um, largely national networks and they're driving conversations on local levels, particularly after these, uh, these incidents that we've seen. Um, I want to share a quote from an activist after, after uh, the Freddie Gray murder. Um, that really kind of speaks to the impact that media is having on our interpretation of events. He says, in the days that followed, we watched with the rest of the world as CNN, Fox News, and all the other national outlets rolled into town with bodyguards, pre-scripted understanding of events, looped footage of fire and mayhem, and live reports staged to look like they were amid a war zone. Any local reporter or bystander will tell you that pretty much on every day, after the violence of April 27, the media outnumbered the protesters, police, or anyone else on the corner of Penn and North. As a result, millions around the world have a false understanding of what happened in Baltimore in April and May. They imagine hordes of angry black mobs and days of fire looting, violence, and murder. I know from conversations with Baltimoreans on the other side of town that they have the same impression. So I think about that, I think that the phrase that got me is the looped footage, right? Think about the experience you have when you're watching, uh, you know, just your 24-hour news channel. And you, there's no time print. You don't know when that happened, if it's still happening, if it's still going on. Um, and think about the kinds of associations that are starting to form in your brain and the, start, the, the, the fear that's literally um, starting to engage in your brain. And so um, the racial paradox we, we are going to make the case today um, 
is of even prim more primary importance in terms of trying to resolve, um, uh, as most of us kind of already reject racism or blatant racism, it's understanding how to practice fairness in a way that recognizes the limitations that our brains have when we experience race. So I'm going to turn it over to Rachel to start unpacking some of the default assumptions underlying the racial paradox, starting with objectivity. Thank you, Alexis. So we all know what objectivity is, lacking bias, judgment, or prejudice in how we see each other. And that obviously is a very aspirational idea. But one of the questions is, how objective can we really be? Now, I notice one person here is drinking coffee, and I'm very grateful. Because what the science tells us, and this is very odd, but it's true, that if you are drinking or holding something warm when you meet someone for the first time, you will receive them more warmly. Anyone who's drinking ice water may perhaps be receiving me more coldly, and so I will encourage you to get some coffee right away so that you enjoy this presentation. And if you happen to be watching this, please go grab some coffee immediately. So again, this, this is the, the scientific term. The brain image shows stronger activity in areas that regulate perception, motor control, self-awareness, and interpersonal experience when stimulated by temperature. So again, you're engaging in a plea deal. You bring the person a cup of coffee. So this is, uh, again, amusing but random. And objectivity can be randomly undermined. But what about the instances in which objectivity is systematically undermined? That's obviously our primary focus today. And what that requires us to do is to understand how our brains operate. So I'm going to begin by asking a few questions. How many triangles do you see? Eight, four, five, eight, four, five more? Eight. eight, another eight. Anyone taken geometry recently? What's the, defi <laughs> what, what's the definition of a triangle? Are there any actual triangles on that screen? Not a single triangle. There's not a Star of David. There are only Pac-Man. And, <laughs> and yet it's almost impossible when we're looking at that screen not to see triangles for a few reasons. One is because we primed you by asking how many triangles do you see? And so your brain's filled in the lines. Um, and another is that we want to see what we expect to see. And so if we expect to see triangles, we want to see triangles. And again, our brains uh, do amazing work. We've actually presented this, and even after offering that explanation, had people argue, but there is one white triangle up there. Like, no, there actually really are no triangles to be seen. So this is another opportunity to engage our brains. So again, audience participation. We're going to have a simple ask to please state the color of the text. Wait till a new color comes on the screen. And state it loudly and as quickly as you can. So let's do a practice run. So someone said, someone said you move too fast. But of course, these are primary colors. These aren't J. Crew, you know, seafoam or mauve, right? These are colors that we know. And we did fine for the first five or so little bunches of text. And yet something happened at the sixth bunch of text where all of a sudden, for some odd reason, people quit stating the simple colors. What happened? Contradiction. The contradiction between the color and the word. Now the ask was to state the color. And yet virtually everyone in the room instead read the word. Now it could be that you're being oppositional because you're not drinking enough coffee and you'll like me enough. But what could also be happening is what? Why did people read when simple colors or reading came into contradiction? Habit. That's what we do. That's what we're taught to do. And as Alexis likes to say, our brains like to be right. And for the most part, when there are a bunch of words, our brains like to correctly solve the puzzle and find out the meaning of those words. So now we can state very clearly that we know how to solve this challenge and this contradiction. We simply don't read. So you now, it, this is the same slide. We're not tricking you by changing everything around. It's an identical slide. And we're going to try it again, knowing precisely what you have to do, which is simply not to read. So let's try again and see what we do. It's still hard. <laughs> 
right? It's still hard. The reason this, the Stroop test was invented in the 1930s, and the reason it's such a valuable tool is because I would presume there are some in this audience and some watching this tape who are skeptical at the idea that somehow our unconscious brain could override our conscious brain when our conscious brain knows what to do. But you've just had the experience of knowing exactly what you were supposed to do. And it was fairly simple. State the color of the text. And yet, it was really difficult to resolve the contradiction, particularly when we were moving quickly. So in order to have your conscious brain override your unconscious brain, what did we have to do? I had to slow down. And the reason for that is our unconscious brain processes, this is science's current number, 11 million bits of information in the same amount of time that our conscious brain processes between 10 and 40. So we have an 11 million to 40 uh, disp it's disparity, and it's because our brain, our unconscious brain, is extraordinarily powerful and quick, and it essentially organizes all the stimuli that we receive, and we're receiving enormous amounts of stimuli every second, it organizes it into information, into, into categories. And so it's, we call them schemas in the science, and it's a mental structure we use to organize information around us, and our brains use schemas to make judgments quickly and efficiently, as we have to do. Because if we had to think every time we saw a, an object and determine whether or not we can sit down, or whether or not we could put an object on a table, if we had to think and evaluate, we would not make it through 15 minutes, much less a whole day. So our brains have to be able to move quickly. It serves many important functions. And our brains categorize people, too. So we have categories uh, from sort of, again, professions, lawyer, engineer, and doctor. And think of who's in your mind. And I'll acknowledge, I don't think of a woman when I see the word engineer. Aspirationally, I of course do. I would be delighted if my, one of my daughters were to become an engineer, but I grew up in a time when there were not many engineers who were women. So my category, my schema for engineer is a man. My schema for doctor, because I live in New York, is, is actually very capacious, and certainly an African-American woman is in my schema for doctors. But you may recall that on Delta Airlines recently, there was an incident where a patient was in distress, and the patient, uh, and as always happens, they, they asked for a doctor, an African-American woman raised her hand, and the flight attendant walked over to her and said, we need an actual doctor. And she said, I have my credentials, and as, she was, as they were having that conversation, a white male walked by and said, I'm a doctor. Oh, thank you, doctor. So one answer to this is, she's a racist. Fire her, and we're fine. And maybe she is, you know, we don't know her. But the question, the possibility, the likelihood even, that Delta would solve its problem simply by firing this one flight attendant is probably slim. Now for lawyer, for many of us in this room, and hopefully in the audience as well, uh, my dear friend Michelle DePass comes to mind. African American woman as a lawyer is part of our schema. But the reason we have this particular picture on the screen is because we did a study recently uh, called the Good Hair Study where we assessed the implicit and explicit attitudes that people have toward black women wearing their hair natural versus smooth. And what we found was nationwide that there are implicit associations, uh, negative associations with black women and natural hair. Even more surprisingly, to be honest, white women like myself, we have explicit negative attitudes toward black women wearing natural hair. And so we lift this up because the extent to which, you know, as workplaces, we are preventing women from coming into the office wearing their hair the way it grows from their head, wearing their hair naturally, that's an enormous obstacle. And it's one, again, that I think a lot of white women don't think of as racism, but in the sense that it is creating these obstacles, it's really important. And actually, we've had 6,000 more people take uh, the, the hair I, implicit association test recently. So this is a continuing, ongoing effort for us to understand how people are responding to this issue, which is of enormous importance. So what determines how we see people beyond the professional categories into which they fit? Well, we have two sort of ways in which we assess who, who a person is. We have stereotypes or traits that we associate with different identity groups, and we also have emotions or attitudes, the valence that we hold toward different groups of people. 
and we can hold positive stereotypes and negative attitudes or vice versa. One interesting sort of uh, disjuncture is toward people who are perceived as, as, as elder or senior, we often have very warm attitudes and yet there are extremely uh, powerful negative associations about competence. The biggest risk, of course, is when there are both negative stereotypes about a particular group and negative emotions. And that's the risk we know that some of our young men and boys of color are experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis. So one of the questions is, do, does how we see people change over time? Why do some stereotypes persist and others don't? So you may not know it because my name isn't Brendan O'Neill, or I guess Brenda O'Neill, uh, but I'm Irish Catholic as well, and so I'm interested in the way that I would have been perceived uh, in the mid-19th century. So the woman to my left, uh, called Bridget McBruder, is how Irish Catholics were contrasted with uh, sort of upper-class British women or Americans who are Protestant, and as you can see, the image of us is literally subhuman. We were considered to be uh, savage, uneducable, uh, promiscuous, and drunk. Now I ask you in the audience, and those of you who are watching, which of those stereotypes continue to persist about the Irish? Let's be honest here. Drunk. Drunk. <laughs> so I will tell you, I will tell you that every single audience we ever ask that question of acknowledges after a little bit of prodding drunk, but then we all giggle. And it's interesting, because I don't think any of us think alcoholism is funny. And I don't think we would have laughed if we had said, what stereotypes about, uh, are stereotypes about alcoholism in Native Americans, right? But something about the drunk Irishman is kind of amusing. It's like a person with a little green hat, you know, sort of being silly and telling stories. So even the negative stereotypes about the Irish have been kind of translated into something amusing. And one of the questions is, how did that happen? How did the Irish and the people who were uh, the other white ethnics, you know, people who are Polish or German or Italian, how did the negative stereotypes that used to exist against these groups suddenly disappear? Well, there's actually a book that tells us the answer called How the Irish Became White. <laughs> so in the post-World War II period, essentially, the government set up a whole host of programs that it were part of what created the segregation that Alexis referred to, where white ethnics were given government support to purchase homes and to move into suburbs and to co-mingle with other white people. And suddenly, the barbecues and the school experiences and the, you know, the PTAs and the parks were places where white ethnics were intermingling with others who were white. And so these differences began to disappear. That didn't happen for African American, Latino, Asian Americans, and others who were perceived as color. They were redlined. And they were, literally, red lines were drawn around communities in which there were significant percentages of people of color. And government monies were not allowed to be used for mortgages in these neighborhoods, nor were people of color uh, given the opportunity to borrow money in the ways that white ethnics were. So the stereotypes that used to abound about the Irish and the Germans and others are now held about Latinos. And because of the segregation that continues to persist, even you know, a generation or so later, the way that people understand groups who aren't like them, as Alexa said, tends to be through the media. So the stereotypes that used to exist toward the Irish, we were poor and on welfare, we took the jobs of the real Americans, in, in uh, scare quotes, we had too many kids, if we were German or Italian or Polish, we refused to speak English. These were all stereotypes that were held against white ethnics, but people don't remember them anymore. As you can see from this 2012 content analysis of news, and this includes Fox, Network News, MSN, and MSNBC, these stereotypes are constantly being you know, sort of looped into our brains and they enter our subconscious. The distortions of media and stereotypes about African Americans, again, are extraordinarily profound and they end up becoming seen as true. So here we have the depictions of poverty among African American families between 1950 and 1992, when many people's you know, sort of formative uh, ideas are formed. Network news and weekly news magazines were portraying African American families as poor at quite the rate that they're actually poor. Now, why is that a problem? Because it may be that these portrayals were happening because someone wanted to create some moral urgency around the issue of disproportionate poverty in communities of color. But even if those were the positive intentions that sort of ended up resulting in these portrayals, what happens is we have these false assumptions. 
for example, about who's benefiting from, uh, from government programs. If we actually look at real numbers, there are 17 million poor white people right now. There are 10 million poor African American and 12 million poor Latinos. In virtually every state in the union, with the exception of a few in the South, white people outnumber uh, poor white people outnumber poor people of color by enormous margins. And yet even government officials often don't know that's true. So what about people who don't watch television or read magazines? There was a project called the Beagle Project that looked at 10 million words, a sample of books, newspapers, magazine articles, et cetera, that the average college educated student would read in a lifetime. And what this study did, it allows us to assess how often Americans have seen or heard words paired together. And what we see is extraordinarily disturbing. The associations that people have about African Americans, poor, violent, religious, lazy, cheerful, dangerous. Whites, wealthy, progressive, conventional, stubborn, successful, educated. Female, distant, warm, curious how those are opposite. Gentle, passive, male, dominant, leader, logical, strong. So again, when we think about these stereotypes, these are visual, that we're receiving them visually from network news, we're receiving them uh, when we read, they're being constantly reinforced in powerful ways. And they result in what we call implicit bias. The automatic, instant association of stereotypes and attitudes toward particular groups without our conscious awareness. Now, in some instances, we may consciously be aware that we have implicit bias, if you think about sort of my conscious awareness that I don't think of women uh, when I see the word engineer, I'm aware that that is my association, but that doesn't get rid of it. So the beginning of dealing with our implicit biases is to be aware of them, but they're, very, they're so powerfully embedded in our brains that we have to do more than that. So how do we know that we have biases? It can't be simply through introspection. Because again, so, many, so much of this exists in our unconscious brains. So there are many different mechanisms. The most popular and the sort of the easiest work for any of us to do to understand our own implicit biases is to take what's called the implicit association test, which is a computer task that you can take on your desktop. You can just Google project implicit or implicit association test and it will pop up. And what it will do is it will see if you can as quickly associate positive words with one group as you can with another. And ideally, of course, and you can see this is the, call the, this is the race implicit attitude test. So ideally, of course, we would be able to as quickly associate positive words with a white face and a black face at an equal rate of speed. But most Americans can't, particularly those of us who are white, we are, again, a significant percentage of us are much faster to associate positive words with a white face than we are with a black face, and faster to associate negative words with a black face than we are with a white face. Now, you might be thinking, well, doesn't everybody just like people who look like them best? Isn't that just natural? Well, actually, if we look at implicit association tests taken in every country in the world, the dominant group, the group in power, likes itself best. <laughs> Just being honest here. <laughs> so those of us who are white are significantly more likely to have implicit preferences toward white people than, for example, African Americans are toward black people. Now, there is a percentage of African Americans who do have a pro-black bias. There's also a percentage of African Americans who have a pro-white bias. And there's a very significant percentage who are, in fact, neutral. And so how can that be? Well, because we all live in the toxic culture. So for some, again, those of us of a particular group, we can have negative associations about our own group because these associations aren't voluntary. We're not choosing them. And so the work we have to do in part is to, for example, take many different variations of the IAT to begin to uncover with respect to various different groups, what might our implicit biases be? How does implicit bias play out in the world? Is it just something that happens in a computer game? Absolutely not. For example, in a test of, of, of law firm partners who have both the same moral imperative that any of us have, but also, frankly, an economic par, uh, imperative to have diversity among their associates, when they were sent a memo, and half of them thought it was written by someone named Tom Meyer who was white. The other half thought it was written by Tom Meyer who was black. He was considered to be a third year associate who went to NYU. Um, and of course, law firms always get the little picture. So it wasn't unusual that they were given the bio with the picture when they evaluated the memo. 
And so we would hope and we would expect, if the lawyers are able to be objective, that the evaluation of the memo would have been the same, because it was the same memo. But when the memo was written, they thought, by someone who was white, they rated it a 4.1 overall. They said he had good analytic skills, needed some work, but. And they found, on average, 2.9 of 7 of the spelling and grammatical errors that were intentionally embedded in the memo. When the identical memo was supposed to have been written by Tom Meyer, who was black, they rated it a 3.2 out of 5. And they said things like, can't believe he went to NYU. And as you can see, they literally, on average, found twice as many of the spelling and grammatical errors that were embedded in the memo. So the old adage, you have to be twice as good, in this instance is literal. And so this is law firm partners who certainly see themselves and strive to be objective. They weren't. Again, with respect to Asian Americans, there's often sort of this notion that Asian Americans are perceived of as the model minority, and they're perceived of as having all sorts of only positive associations linked to them. But what Jerry Kong, one of our research advisors, found when they had a deposition that was read and listened to by prospective jurors, and the jurors were asked to assess the, you know, whether the person was someone who was competent, whether he was assertive, whether he was likable. When the jurors thought that it was a person who was white, like the gentleman on my left, they thought very highly of him. The jurors thought significantly less highly if they thought he was Asian American, the same voice. So our objectivity has to be deeply questioned according to the evidence. Healthcare. Now, again, I think we think of doctors, and there certainly doctors think of themselves as people who are both able to be objective and certainly people who want to give the greatest care. And yet, what studies have shown, including a recent study of children going into the emergency room to receive appendectomies for acute appendicitis, is that doctors give significantly lower levels of painkillers to those who are black and Latino than they do to those who are white. I don't think any of us think that doctors wake up in the morning wanting black children to be in pain. But the result of stereotypes and associations, it appears, of how people perceive pain results in black children not giving adequate level of medication when they're receiving appendectomies. There's also, again, there, there's some good news because the, the, the work in healthcare around implicit bias has been extraordinarily robust, in part because of a 2007 study uh, involving uh, cardiac conditions. And what, what this study involved were residents given identical files with just the race uh, different. And what they thought the what they were required to do was both diagnose the particular condition and recommend treatment. And these same residents had taken an implicit association test a few weeks before. Residents who had higher levels of implicit bias against African Americans were able to diagnose accurately across race but they were significantly less likely to recommend the gold standard treatment of thrombolosis if they had high levels of implicit bias. That was in 2007. Now that study appropriately rocked the medical world. And they started doing a lot of work to think about what could be done to overcome the risk of treatment recommendations being affected by someone's race or ethnicity. And so in recent uh, 2012 and 2014 studies of treatment recommendations, when the protocols are clear, there's been no association between implicit bias levels and treatment recommendations. The challenge continues to be for doctors when the protocol's not so clear, so when there's subjectivity, or when the issue involves interpersonal relationships between doctor and patient. So there was an end of life study of doctors that showed that white doctors were significantly less likely to spend as much time, uh, to have as much kind of physical contact, to be as warm, toward black patients at the end of life than they were white patients. So this issue, this issue of interaction, continues to be a challenge in that context. How do implicit biases determine how we see threat? Now this is a study from March 13, 2017, and people were shown identically sized black and white men. And what the study found was that these identically sized men uh, were seen differently. Identically, uh, the black men were seen as larger, stronger, and more muscular than the white men. The black men were perceived as more capable of causing harm and hypothetical altercation. And this was the case regardless of the race of the participants in the study. Where there was divergence is sort of what followed. So for the white participants in the study, they thought that police would be more justified in using force to subdue the black men 
uh, even if the men were unharmed. So the African-American and Latino participants did not join that final conclusion, though they did see the threat differently at the outset. Lack of objectivity can make us misread faces. Now, I know these are the creepiest looking people you've ever seen. <laughs> and I would particularly identify the white guy on top as being very, very creepy. Um, and yet the study here involved people seeing these little faces go by quickly with the goal of being to press the button when the face became you know, happy. And those of us who were white took longer to see the faces happy. With the white face, we saw them happy in three. It took us till the fourth you know, little square to see the black faces happy. And that has implications, right? If we're judging faces differently, and if we see a black face as being angry longer, that matters when we think about criminal justice. There's also the risk, and criminal de uh, defense lawyers know this better than anybody, there's also the risk of complete misidentification. So there's, again, a robust study showing that it's difficult to identify faces across race or ethnicity for any of us. So we all, for the most part, regardless of our race or ethnicity, are, have, find it easier to look at this sort of you know, subtle differences between faces of people of our own group. But of course, what matters most in misidentification is who's in power and the implications or the potential outcomes of those misidentifications. So again, same phenomena, but they may have different outcomes. So this is crucial. How does implicit bias affect how people remember facts? This study involved either White William or Black Tyrone, and people are told the story. Needless to say, it's not described as White William or Black Tyrone because that would be weird. Um, but they're given a story about someone named William or someone named Tyrone, and then they're distracted for 15 minutes. And they're asked, when they come back, to recall the details and share the details they remember. With William, the people remembered fewer of the aggressive uh, details about the incident. With Tyrone, people correctly remembered the aggressive details. They also made up some details. Mm -hmm. So they remembered, quote unquote, details that didn't actually exist. Now, there's nothing to suggest that people did this intentionally, but something about the trigger of the name Tyrone versus William resulted in remembering more aggressive details. This is obviously relevant to the work that criminal defense attorneys do. So again, the risks of our stereotypes about black males extend even further. So this was a study done to see how quickly, whether or not being primed with faces would affect how quickly people see either crime uh, relevant objects or neutral objects. And so people if you remember from the, the, early, the 70s and, and like popcorn and various commercials, priming involves like a split second image that you don't even know you saw. So what happened in this study where people were either primed, given a subliminal image of a black face, a white face, or squiggly orange lines, and then the question was whether they would see neutral objects or crime relevant objects at different levels of speed. We would hope being primed with either face wouldn't matter. They were given these pixelated images, they were smaller, and again asked to identify them, uh, the, the object whenever they saw it. So here's frame one of an object, here's frame 20, here's frame 41. And what we find is when the control, squiggly orange lines are faced and it's a crime irrelevant object, flash a black face, crime irrelevant object, flash a white face, crime irrelevant object, these are basically, you know, sort of there's no difference. What about when you flash the orange lines? Do, do ever, people see crime relevant objects faster uh, when you have orange lines? It turns out no, they see them at the same rate of speed. Look how much faster people see the crime relevant objects when a black face has been flashed. And look how much longer it takes to see the crime relevant object when a white face is flashed. There is a presumption of innocence that is linked to whiteness that results in people taking longer to see the crime relevant object. Now, would it matter if there were different ages? You would hope that it would, in a sense, matter. You would hope that being primed with an image of a five-year-old, you know, beautiful little face, that people wouldn't have any faster association of a crime-relevant object uh, than a, than a toy-related object. And this study was done uh, with college students in 2015. So another one of the questions the study attempted to answer is, have associations and implicit biases changed with the new generation, with, again, our, our sort of growing levels of egalitarian values in college students? I think you'll be uh, perhaps not surprised, but I think if you're like me, depressed to know that being flashed uh, with a, primed with a face of a five-year-old white boy, they saw uh, toys faster. Being flashed with the face of a five-year-old black boy, they saw guns faster. Does race alone matter, or do features and actual color matter? 
Uh, this was a, a, an interesting, powerful, and again, extraordinarily disturbing study done by Jennifer Eberhardt. And it was done in part because there had been a few studies that showed uh, very little sentencing disparities uh, when there was someone black versus someone white. And so what researchers did was they dug deeper to see whether the race alone uh, would be changed if you also factored in Afrocentricity of features and shade of skin. And what they found was there was an enormous difference, except in this instance, it also mattered who the victim was. So this was looking at uh, death, penalty, uh, death eligible cases in Philadelphia, and the question was whether the, again, Afrocentricity of features and shade of skin would matter when there was a black defendant and a white victim, uh, as you can see, it mattered enormously it didn't matter at all when it was the same race of a victim and defendant. So, the, and, and there was another study done showing the Afrocentricity and shade of skin matter for sentencing. These were cases uh, in Florida and resulted in, in an increased sense of about eight months on average. So part of what th this helps explain is how it's implicit bias. It's not sort of knowing someone's race per se in these instances, particularly involving judges who are trying to use care, but the subliminal associations that occur with, um, with skin color and Afrocentricity. This is an even more powerfully disturbing study, and it goes beyond what we call implicit bias. This is a question of whether or not people dehumanize people on the basis of race. So Phil Goff, uh, one of our uh, advisors, did this study, and the, and the question, it's actually difficult even to discuss this study, because his question was, is there an association of black faces uh, with apes? This is an age-old, again, utterly a horrific stereotype that we would think wouldn't be salient anymore, but it turns out there is a percentage of people, and it's a lower percentage of people, who implicitly dehumanize black people, uh, who do make this association between black faces and apes, and what follows from that dehumanization is perceiving age differently. So the people who were more likely to make this association, when they saw faces of boys who were around 13, would add on average you know, almost five years to the black boy's age. And police officers, because Phil Goff does a lot of work in police departments and does these studies with police officers, police officers who implicitly dehumanize people are three times more likely to use excessive force among juveniles. So there's again a, an effect on their who they view as a, as a child, as a boy versus a man, and it leads to you know, sort of our worst case scenario of excessive use of force. For those of us who are not in the category of dehumanizing people, and that's most of us, again, this is a small sub-percentage, but we do hold implicit biases, and again, that's most of us. And in fact, every single one of us holds some implicit biases against some group. We might not, it might not be the same group depending upon how we're situated, but we all hold some implicit biases. What we have to be aware of is our implicit biases can affect our evaluations, our cognitive evaluations of someone's work, of what stories we remember, of what details we remember. It's also manifested in how we're seen by them because implicit biases are often manifested in our behavior. They've done studies where people take an implicit association test, they come into the, you know, to the laboratory a few weeks later, and someone who doesn't know the result of that test watches them in interactions that are cross-group. And people who have implicit biases are more apt to stand further away, to not have eye contact, and have more hostile body language. And so again, most of us believe body language as being more reflective of truth than any words that we use. What's complicated about implicit bias, in a sense, is that there's two truths. Because for most of the people who would be involved in a study like this, they don't have explicit bias against a particular group but it's the implicit bias that is conveyed in the body language. So this is gonna be, again, deeply dispiriting. I promise to have some uplift soon with, with interventions. Uh, implicit bias is increased by stress, time pressure, multitasking, lack of clear criteria for decision making, ambiguous or incomplete information, and lack of familiarity with the group. I'm sure none of that is relevant to any of the work that anyone in this room does. Um, of course, it's the opposite, right? When we think about the criminal defense work. Implicit bias is not reduced simply by good intentions, by someone telling you to reduce your bias. Remember when I told you not to read in the Stroop test? Didn't work. Simply trying to suppress the bias. The whole point of implicit biases is in some sense they're already suppressed. So if you just try to suppress them, it's like as Alexis likes to say, being on a no carb diet where you see bread everywhere. 
Avoiding people from other groups, which often is also linked to implicit bias, uh, is extraordinarily unhelpful because the best way it turns out for us to reduce our biases, as we'll discuss, is to have authentic peer uh, interaction with people of other groups. And critically, and I have to say this to everyone who may be listening, if we think we don't have bias, if we're convinced that we're the ones who uniquely are able to be objective, we are extraordinarily risky. So I sometimes talk about the perils of the white liberal. This is one. If I assume because of you know, my commitment, my 25 years as a civil rights lawyer, that I'm somehow immune from implicit bias, I'm dangerous because I'm not being careful. So again, everyone who is committed to the work that you're doing, that commitment has to be manifested not in presuming that you don't have bias, but actually investigating which biases you might have to figure out where you might be vulnerable of behaving differently. So what do we do? Now, de-biasing is a risky word to use because it's impossible for any of us to eliminate or completely de-bias ourselves. There are too many different groups and we're, again, being constantly um, bombarded by too many different negative images to just get rid of our biases. But we can, particularly with groups who we have, with whom our interactions are most important or about whom our decisions are most important, we can, doing a you know, constant uh, set of work, begin to make our biases less salient and powerful by engaging in, in the following steps. And this is all work by Patricia Devine at the University of Wisconsin. So the first thing we have to figure out is what biases against which groups we have, and then what behaviors that we engage in may be or likely to have been triggered by that. So one example from the study that she, that she does is a white woman on the Madison campus who realizes when black males walk by her, she does this unconscious flinch. Now she realizes once she starts to interrogate herself, why is she flinching? She's never had any negative interaction with a black male. And statistically, if we think about it, as a white woman, she's most likely to have any kind of harm from another white male or from someone in a fraternity. Sorry for those of you who are in fraternities. Um, can't help it. I, I went to Madison. It's, sorry about that. Um, so again, the, the, this, this subliminal response that she has has no grounding in fact. And what she realizes when she begins to think about it is she is doing harm. If, the man who walks by her or the young man who walks by her sees this flinch, it is being communicated to him that she is someone who is responding to him as though he's dangerous, and that is a harm. So she first identifies these behaviors, or we all, any of us identify these behaviors, and then we begin to work on creating counter stereotypes around us, either by envisioning people we know, putting up images of people, again, who are counter to stereotypes. Um, ideally, again, we're gonna talk about spending time with people who are counter stereotypes, and part of what this work is to begin doing is to learn to individuate. Instead of seeing people in particular groups as monolithic, consisting of the stereotypes about them, we begin to see people as individuals and that, you know, that involves asking questions and learning information and understanding how many of our associations and stereotypes are factually wrong and understanding how much difference there is uh, among people of particular groups. But part of this involves keeping in our minds how people do self-identify. Because one of the things that often happens, particularly to those of us who are white, is if we meet someone or interact with someone or see someone who's inconsistent with the negative stereotype about their group, we exceptionalize. Well, he or she isn't like, or I don't think of them as, and these themselves are harmful acts. Because again, we're, we're accepting the stereotypes and putting someone apart from them. That's not the work we want to do. What we want to do is seeing people in all their variation, but also being able to recognize and celebrate how they self-identify. So that's individuating. Perspective taking is another one of the steps that are, that's both crucial and challenging. So sometimes when we think about perspective taking, we think of what we would do in a particular situation. So how many of you heard, well, if a police officer had told me to stand on the sidewalk, I just would have done so. That's not perspective taking, right? And I'm talking about the Michael Brown incident. Because when I'm doing that, I'm thinking of what my experience as an almost 50-year-old white female you know, wearing a nice shirt would be with a police officer. And it would be, ma'am, would you please step onto the sidewalk? Oh, thank you, officer, for being so concerned about my safety. Have a nice evening, ma'am. Have a nice evening, officer. That's my experience. But that is not the experience Michael Brown had, as we know. So perspective taking has to be based upon deep information about what someone else's life might be like. 
and being able to think about what it would feel like to be living and experiencing the world differently. Finally, and most importantly, is increased opportunities for contact. Now, this has to be peer-to-peer -peer contact for it to actually alter stereotypes. And the reason I say that is because when I've shared this with different groups, I've had judges say, well, I have lots of different, uh, uh, lots of contact with people of different races and ethnicities. And I'll say, that's wonderful, judge. Uh, with, you know, in what context do you have this contact? Well, in my courtroom, of course. <laughs> Intergroup contact is not when you're in a position of power. And particularly not when it's in a context in which people are likely to be at their most vulnerable and in potentially the most stereotypical of positions. So the idea is to be in authentic relationships and literally friendships can be the most powerful ways of changing and reducing our stereotypes. And social psychologists really are only willing to say that implicit biases are truly reduced when we have you know, sort of continuous authentic relationships across group. Everything else they say is temporary. So really you know, sort of finding those opportunities. But I, I do have to say, you can't just find the next person of color you see and ask them to be your friend, because that's not fair to make them do that work. These have to be authentic and reciprocal. So the reducing bias is crucial work. But let's be realistic. We're, again, not going to be able to completely reduce them. So the work that we have to do is to pr break the link between the biases we may hold and our behavior in the world. And this is where the real work comes. And this is where the work has to be very specific and contextualized to the work any of us do. So you have to begin, of course, by resisting this idea that we, you're objective. You have to identify in your work or in any position where you're powerful, what are the key decision points? What are the key interactions? These are the instances in which the bias may play out in the most potentially harmful way. Identify clear and fair criteria to the extent possible to reduce ambiguity. Make sure that those criteria don't have baked in bias. We know there are all sorts of instances in which bias can be baked into the way the criteria are identified. Increasing motivation to be fair is referring to the difference between sort of trying to be uh, non-biased because you think that's what you're supposed to do and having being non-biased core to who you are. And so there's this measure of internal motivation to be fair versus external motivation to be fair, and powerful differences found in the behavior of people who have an internal motivation versus a, this is what I'm supposed to be because people think of me a certain way. When we're in that external place, it's harder for us to actually do the work. I end with this one, and I say it with great caveat. If possible, decrease time pressure and load. And you know why I say this with a caveat, right? Because the work that everyone does often happens very quickly. And so that's why when there's work that you know requires fast decision making, that's where setting up the criteria and coming up with you know, sort of mechanisms to prevent the bias is going to be the most important and as a systemic measure as opposed to making it being the individual work. But as we saw from the Stroop test, to the extent that you can slow down, that does help. So again, this is the, the work that we can do. And you'll have an ability to sort of think about that in your own context. Thank you for your presentation. You, you really beautifully discussed what's a complicated and really important conversation. But I've been um, following a little bit about um, the conversation recently regarding the implicit association test. And I know that there's some controversy about whether or not that's a valid instrument. And so I was hoping just to hear directly from you about your thoughts on that. No, thank you. Thank you very much for, for lifting that up. And um, so for those who are not familiar with the controversy, there are, there, there's a set of concerns raised by researchers about whether, two sets of concerns. One is, does the implicit association test, is it actually a valid measure of implicit bias? Because often when people take it multiple times, their scores vary. And so there's, there's criticism of the test for that reason. And that's a reasonable criticism. Anyone who thinks of the implicit association test as a precise test about an individual is misunderstanding the, the work that that test can do. It's very useful when we're talking about large data sets and looking at trends. Uh, and it's shown to uh, be, be consistent with other you know, much more rigorous and replicable, or, uh, able to be replicated uh, uh, tests of implicit bias. 
Um, but it's not a very good individual tool, which is why when the implicit association test initially came out, lawyers wanted every juror to take it, every judge to take it, every teacher to take it, and if you had implicit bias, you're fired. And the social psychologist said that's ridiculous. It's not a test that has that degree of individual uh, you know, kind of clarity, as well as having implicit biases don't mean that we behave according to them. We can be aware of them and, and act uh, differently. There's also a set, uh, but, so, but, so, so again, the criticisms of the IAT as a test of an individual's bias are reasonable, but that's kind of setting up a straw person because there are a whole host of other measures of implicit bias that are, you know, that, again, sort of people's cortisol levels or people's behavior, you know, different treatment of an identical scenario with the, you know, merely the change of a name. So there's, there's endless number, there's a recent studies of eye tracking uh, that Emily Balsitas at NYU does showing that you know, whites and uh, if you have uh, people looking at dash cam videos, uh, people who are white are often apt to look at the, uh, everyone looks at who they're threatened by. Those of us who are white are much more apt to look at the African American person and the, someone who's African American is much more apt to look at uh, the, the police officer because we see different people as threats. And the result of that is we see different stories. So there's a whole host of measures of how, how our biases, how our stereotypes about different groups affect our behavior in addition to the IAT. The IAT is, has been suggested most effective at looking at, again, the trends and tendencies across large data sets. So that's the response to the question, is implicit bias uh, you know, sort of real? No social psychologist is suggesting implicit bias isn't an important issue, just the question of whether the IAT is an effective measure. There's also a question of whether any of the me, the mechanisms to reduce bias are effective, and so there's been, you know, sort of attempts to replicate many of the attempts to reduce bias, and most of them have been shown to be short term, which is why at this point we're being really careful uh, as well to say, let's try to do what we can to reduce bias, but again, what the social psychologists are will agree to say is that authentic cross group, you know, friendships and relationships reduce bias, almost nothing else does in the long term. But everybody acknowledges that what's most important are systemic, uh, you know, sort of multifaceted attempts to delink stereotyping and biases and behavior. So, if that's not a good test for individuals, is there a, a good test for so, individuals? So, so again, what what I think the social psychologist would say is, even though it's not a perfect test for individuals, it's still if you're just trying to get a sense of where sort of your challenges might lie, not in a sort of perfect, you know, sort of it's it's it's. It may not be a perfect test, but it still gives you some information that's useful. And at this point, I don't think there's an easy to find test that any of us can take, particularly over so many different groups. Because what's useful about the IAT is there's so many different uh, iterations of it with respect to so many different groups that you can get a sense of where you're vulnerable and take that information and work with it. So that's what we would say about that.